Welcome to another exciting edition of Time for Hemp. I'm your guest host, Paul Stanford, sitting in for Casper Leach. Casper is recovering from some successful surgery, take out a little uh, uh, benign tumor he had, and he's recovering well. He should be back here in about, oh, uh, the 22nd, I believe it is. Monday the 22nd, he's scheduled to come back. But I'm sitting in in the meantime. This is Paul Stanford. You're listening to the American Freedom Radio Network. And I'd like to give a shout out to our uh, grant that we received from KDK Distributors. KDK Distributors has given a grant to Time for Hemp to allow us to remain loud and proud and headshopcanada.com as well. And so uh, we want to thank them and urge you, uh, our loyal listeners, to... uh, you know, support our advertisers here on Time for Hemp, including KDKWholesale.com. And if you're a low-income patient, KDK Wholesale gives away a free vaporizer every month. So you can just write them and uh, get in queue to get a free vaporizer. And I recommend vaporization as opposed to smoking. We have a good show for you today. We have our uh, guest host is uh, uh, Carrie Burns. Welcome to the show, Kerry. Thank you, Paul. How you doing? I'm doing very, very well. How about yourself? Oh, I can't complain. We're just uh, sweltering through this Texas heat. It's uh, We've been over 100 degrees now for about a month and a half, and it's about to get old. I grew up in Dallas, so I remember it very, very well. Well, you, uh, you, I remember I'm, having... sure you're, I'm sure you're missing it. <laughs> <laughs> I moved out of Dallas. My my mom moved out of Dallas when I was 15, and I've only been back uh, for a couple of days since then, back in uh, the last day of 79, the first day of 1980. So I have Well, 80, see, here. yeah, well, 80, that's the year that uh, we had all the record heat, kind of like what we're seeing this year. It, uh, in fact, they, they've been doing side-by-side comparisons of the temperatures from 1980 and this, the ones we're seeing this year, and they're real close. So you probably got a real good taste of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember it well. I uh, I was more acclimated to it then, but uh, I did get down to a couple uh, uh, southern cities this year and experienced 106 degrees in Atlanta and uh, Alabama and in Charlotte, North Carolina. So uh, it has been a, a big heat wave this year. Uh, I don't know whether that validates global warming or not, or if the planet's just been getting warmer since the the big last glacier age ended. But uh, uh, I know we could certainly solve some of the uh, carbon problems by legalizing industrial hemp and using hemp for fuel. We're, our country's so stupid. I mean, we, we let these clowns up in Washington bounce around. They can't even balance a checkbook. And we're letting th- these people decide whether or not uh, that people should be allowed to smoke marijuana. And, and, of course, mainly what you said, we're preventing the hemp industry, the one thing that really would give America a chance to come out of this doldrum we've been in for so long. And we just have all these stupid people running the show. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it is. It's dysfunctional. There's no doubt about it. There's uh, a lot that needs to be fixed in our dysfunctional uh, corporate fascist government. You know, basically the Nazis won... World War II, and uh, we implemented, as soon as they uh, got uh, Reagan in office, uh, uh, the firm marriage between corporate America and uh, the state. And now they're trying to to eliminate the middle class and eliminate all the programs that support the middle class and just support the upper crust. And uh, uh, we've got to do something to change it. And I think the first step is to... Uh, legalize hemp and take the money out of the energy industry and give it to our farmers. And I think that's what will happen when we legalize marijuana. It's, it's the truth. I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. I mean, this was, this was an industry that was a mainstay in this country forever. You know, our, our colonists, they wouldn't have thrived if they hadn't have been growing hemp. I mean, it was just, it was fact, required by law, you know, George Washington right. started growing hemp because he had to by law to supply the British crown with, hemp to caulk their ships and hemp for their ropes and their sails. So right. uh, I uh, uh, researched uh, Washington, and I uh, saw that George Washington received a package of hashish from a London doctor named Anderson. 
and he wrote a letter back to him saying, thank you for the artificial preparation of hemp from Silesia. Silesia is an area there in uh, eastern Germany and Czechoslovakia, or, mm -hmm. or the Czech Republic, I should say today. I'm showing my age there. But uh, he said <laughs> that the, uh, the, uh, he really appreciated the artificial preparation of hemp from Silesia, and he'd have to make more time for it, the wrapping up of a long and laborious session of Congress. So I don't think uh, uh, there's any uh, question that uh, George Washington was trying some hashish when he was in the in the White House as our first president. And he definitely enjoyed uh, growing cannabis. In fact, his very last letter that he wrote was to his plantation foreman saying, uh, have you procured the uh, hemp seed I require and uh, to plant it in a specific spot? And he was separating the males out and keeping the females. So uh -huh. he was definitely growing for the flowers and the seed and the oil. And so, uh, But you know what? We have the editor of Skunk Magazine on, Johnny V. Welcome to the show, Johnny. Hey, how you doing, Paul? Nice to be here again. Very well. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. We're just busy as usual, um, working on the next issue. Like always, we seem to be working on uh, five issues at once, but everything's doing really well. That's the way it is in the publishing world. So do you publish monthly? We're about to hit a five-week cycle, yeah. We were every six weeks. Now we're going every every five plus a couple of special issues a year. So we will be practically a monthly magazine, 12 times a year, but uh, a couple issues will overlap. So just give us that so extra week. You're up to your 50th issue now, is that correct? That's what's on the stands right now. Yeah, it's getting a lot of buzz. Uh, there's some pretty unique things in there. Well, congratulations. Actually That's a real milestone that most publications never make it to. No, most don't last their first year, especially in this industry. There's been a lot of, uh, like, uh, Johnny come lightly, but uh, wait, we, we had a rough time in the beginning. We've sunk in a, lot, a whole lot of money, but we're, we're here seven years later. We're here and stronger than ever. Congratulations. Yeah, that's the way it is. It's always rough at first, but uh, dedication and, and hard work uh, uh, and perspiration will uh, keep you going. Well, there's been a lot of long, long, hazy nights. I mean, it's been fun while we're doing it, too. You know, I think, Great. Uh, yeah, we just did pretty unique issues. We've dedicated to, to activists, outlaws, uh, and there's a list up there of uh, hundreds of top activists and interviews. And, uh, and you know, we did the interview with Mark Emery behind bars, a uh, tribute to Ben Mazel, who's been... Uh, Great. ...who fought this war for a long, long time. I mean, it's... It's pretty good. If you haven't if you haven't picked it up, uh, make sure you give me an address so I can send you a couple. Yeah, I'd love to take a look at it. I should just uh, uh, go on there and subscribe. I guess. I yeah. uh, heard though you mentioned Ben Mazel that the city of Madison, Wisconsin, has uh, named April twentieth as Ben Mazel Day. They've dedicated uh, April twentieth as their annual Ben Mazel Day. So well, the city of Madison, Wisconsin, is honoring him, and he certainly deserves the honor. He deserves it. I wonder if he would have expected it, though. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he would have expected it. I don't. I think he'd be pleasantly surprised. But yeah. you know, Ben show you how opened up the Capitol all uh, to free speech activities, and uh, he knew the Constitution. He knew the law. He was a brilliant man, a chess master. And uh, grandmaster, chess grandmaster, and uh, it's my honor to have uh, known him and uh, I've been able to work with him a little bit you know, over the years. Last he time I went through end. Madison, I stopped there. It was in 2009. I gave Ben a call, and he came over to the hotel, and we vaporized the night away and chatted away. That was great pleasure. Well, yeah, no, I learned a lot about him just for this story uh, that was done by Steve Wojcicki on him and quite quite an impressive uh, life he led yeah him opening up the wisconsin state capitol basically led to the union workers being able to express their free rights and all the protests that have gone on about the uh, conservative tea party uh, governor of wisconsin trying to curtail union rights organize so uh, they know and ben was there as long as he could be in fact, uh, they told him when they diagnosed him with cancer that, uh, uh, you know, you got to stay still here for a day. You're going to you could die if you go out on. He said, I don't care. I'm going to die anyway. I'm going out on the streets. And so uh, 
within hours of getting his uh, diagnosis, he was out there protesting uh, uh, for freedom and freedom of speech. Well, I think once you, you know, you, you, he, he lived how he had to live. So basically, he's not, I mean, nothing to prevent him from, uh, from saying his piece. And I know he mentored a lot of a lot of the activists that were are part of the younger group that we had uh, featured in the magazine. Some of them. He he came off. He came. His name was mentioned often when when we were discussing who was their uh, mentor or who inspired them. You know, I know that yeah. one uh, a lady that works for us right now, Diane Fornbacher, considers her considers Ben or considered Ben her one of her greatest inspirations in the movement. You know, and he transcended yeah. the movement. I mean, he was an activist. He. he he represented people more than more than any one one issue. That's right. That's right. I guess before he was eighteen, he was on Richard Nixon's enemy list. You know, because he had uh, organized around the uh, during when he was sixteen, uh, been arrested at the Chicago uh, demonstrations uh, against the Vietnam War, and uh, he's a brilliant man. Well, uh, absolutely. Well, he would, he would be honored to be on. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Carrie, tell us a little bit about your situation and uh, history. Yeah, for, okay, thank you, Paul. And hi, Johnny. How you been doing? Hey, Carrie. Uh, like I said, we're doing great, and uh, pleasure Con- to be on the show with you. Congratulations on your fiftieth uh, publication. There, I tell you, the uh, business man, you got a. For at least five years, you starve to death. People don't realize that, but it's hard. And uh, y'all just keep it up. You'll make it there. Thank you very much. Uh, you we've very just, much. Uh, Paul, we've been busy doing the same things, you know, uh, been making, trying to put out the uh, Cannabis Corner videos each week. We're really just trying to exp- explain to people how absurd the laws are against cannabis and drugs in general. I mean, and we're well, that's to... really hard down in Texas. I'd say that's one of the, oh. the hardest states to organize in, especially. Oh, my. You just can't imagine. I mean, uh, one of the guys in Congress said the other day, he hit it right on the nail. He said, you know, the entire Congress's brain is stuck in the reefer madness mode of the 30s. And it's so true. And they, you know, there was so much going on back then and the mindsets of people and here we are eight decades later, and yet we're letting that mindset control everything today. It's just, I, I'm tired of living among the stupid. It's just, uh, that's my, so what we're trying to do is just, you know, remind people, you know, our founding fathers, that's what this country's foundation was, is freedom. And this is your personal right, an individual choice. You know, if you want to drink whiskey, do it. You want to smoke some weed, do it. You want to grow hemp, let's do it. And we just don't, we don't understand you know how people's lives can be ruined over over a harmless herb in a textile. It just doesn't even make sense. Well, unfortunately, I think the reality is a little bit more sinister than stupidity. I think the reefer madness is a weapon they use. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that you know it's stupidity that prevails. It's basically it's money and uh, no, it's yeah. it's oh, it is money. Yeah. control. Marijuana prohibition is not about drugs and not about marijuana. That's just a smokescreen. Pardon the right. pun on that. It's really about the continued centralization of economic and political control. It's about money and power. And the petrochemical industry made up the whole reefer madness myth to protect their monopolistic industries, the petrochemical industry. With the invention of new machinery, hemp harvesting became a lot cheaper, and they realized, gee, nobody's going to need petroleum in about 10 years when they start using this hemp seed oil. Just like that uh, popular mechanics ad uh, for uh, hemp, the billion-dollar crop, had uh, advocated back in 1937. Uh, hemp was going to take over all of the uh, uh, uses or the majority of uses for petroleum. And so uh, they, they fed us this pablum that didn't affect many people at the time. You know, there's this book out there that was co-written by... Uh, uh, the fellow in California called uh, Freedom of Cannabis. It was so the guy who ran for governor is libertarian. Uh, anyway, he says that cannabis is uh, uh, the plant kingdom's way to reach out with us and try to restore balance. I'll okay. come up with his name here in a minute. Well, so makes sense. true. And these were these lies are perpetuated now by the. Uh, 
pharmaceutical, alcohol, tobacco industry. You know, they're using it to to uh, to make sure that the competition is not there. Well, what's so strange to me? All of those people that are in competition, the pharmaceuticals, all of the oil producers and stuff like that, they're all businessmen. And what I don't really understand is this is an industry that they could make more profit at than what they're doing now. And and it would correct so many issues that they even have to deal with regulations and stuff. The, this hemp industry would free them from all that, and, they're, and they would actually make more money. They're the ones that are sitting on all the money. Can you imagine, you know, the average gas well that they drill out here, it's two or $3 million investment. That, you know, you may dry a whole the thing and not get a dime out of it. Can you imagine what you could do, how much hemp and fuel you could produce if you took that $3 million and bought hemp seed with it and planted it? I mean... It, it just doesn't even make sense to me. I that's why I'm saying this. We're we're in this brain dead society. I know they're trying to control, but they're usually all about money, and, and this is a way they could actually make more money. I don't get it. Yeah, well, one end, but I mean, I've, I've read studies as well that, like, pharmaceutical industry, uh, the use of opiates or opiate derivatives would would drop by forty percent if if uh, if cannabis was available in a wide stretch on the kind of mainstream kind of level, and they would be in competition with something that people can grow up, grow on their own. So, I mean, that's, I think that's what frightens them a little bit more. Um, and there's the whole prison industrial complex, the the police, drug squads, the... I'm sure there's a case that just teams. came out that uh, I think it was in Pennsylvania where a judge was just sentenced 28 years in prison. Hey, we're coming up on our commercial break here. We've got Johnny V on as our guest. He is the editor of Skunk Magazine. And Carrie Burns from CannabisCorner.us. I'm Paul Stanford sitting in for Casper Leach, and you're on the American Freedom Radio listening to Time for Hemp. Hey, it's a party! Welcome back to Time for Hemp. I'm your guest host, Paul Stanford, sitting in for the illustrious Casper Leach. We send a big get well Casper out to you. We should have him back here on the show as he's recovering from some surgery coming up on the 22nd of this month. Just another week or so. And so uh, I have my joint host on the air here, Mr. Kerry Burns, the host of CannabisCorner.us. Welcome back, Kerry. Thank you, Paul. And I want to say hi and send out my love to Casper and wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, and can't wait to get him back. And I was dancing in my seat. Boy, that was some good music. Yeah, yeah. Now the, they they grew good hemp in in Poland with those polkas. So uh, yeah, I love that organ and that. Uh, uh, I guess it was an accordion in the background, but man, it was good. Then we have Johnny V standing by, the editor of Skunk Magazine. Welcome back, Johnny. Hey, thank you, Paul. Nice to be here again. And again, I want we want to say uh, welcome uh, soon or get well soon to Casper. Uh, he's been a really good friend to our magazine. So. As soon as he gets back, we'll be sure to come up and uh, say hello to him again. Great, great. Um, yeah, Carrie and I were talking a little bit about legalization here, and, uh, you know, it looks like there are going to be several complete legalization initiatives on the ballot uh, for November 2012 in uh, Colorado. SAFER uh, has put forward a proposal, and they're going to start gathering signatures soon to completely legalize marijuana in the state of Colorado and regulate it. Then in California, there are a couple of different initiatives going. One is the Cannabis and Hemp Initiative that Jack Herrer had written, and a group of uh, people are behind that and gathering signatures now. And then there's another group of people, uh, perhaps with much deeper pockets, uh, Richard Lee and uh, uh, other folks associated with Peter Lewis, along with uh, uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 5, uh, a big union down there that's been uh, unionizing cannabis workers in the dispensaries and the cannabis fields. And so they've all come together to put together another initiative. They haven't put the wording out yet, but they're working on it for November of next year. Then up in Washington State, there's the Yep, and the NAW initiative. There's uh, New Approaches Washington that seems to have uh, big funding behind them that would regulate cannabis in the state's liquor stores. And uh, then there's an, another initiative, Yep, uh, Say Yes uh, to Cannabis, and they are uh, attempting to remove all the penalties regarding uh, 
the illegality of cannabis. And here in Oregon, we have our Oregon Cannabis Tax Act petition. I'm the main spokesperson and proponent behind that. And we're attempting to uh, legalize hemp and cannabis, allow adults to grow their own without any regulation, and uh, also legalize industrial hemp without any regulation for fuel, food, and fiber. And in fact, we implement a system of controls and regulations that are mandated by international treaties. So we actually, I think our model, I don't want to come off as, as too egotistical here, but our model, the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, is the only model yet devised that takes into account the international and uh, constitutional legal issues regarding cannabis prohibition. We specifically wrote it to be upheld in court, and we take 2% of the proceeds from the sale of marijuana to adults through state licensed doors uh, and dedicate it to uh, new state commissions to promote hemp fuel, fiber, and food. So uh, uh, we urge you to find out more about that. You can go to cannabistaxact.org that's cannabistaxact.org or uh, it'll redirect you from octa octa 2012.org or you can go to the portal to all the different websites for my nationwide medical marijuana clinics uh, and uh, the initiative and uh, other things at hemp.org that's h-e-m-p dot o-r-g well I wish you well I mean I remember uh, during the last uh during uh, Prop 19, we were actually probably the only magazine that covered both sides because there were a lot of people against it as well. And we were threatened by so many boycotts within the industry that it just made me shake my head, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. All we did as a, as a media outlet was try to present the, the pros and cons. And, you know, a lot of people just uh, attacked us for, for doing so, you know. Mm-hmm. It showed me that there's a lot of people in the industry that are short-sighted as well. It's not all, uh, it's not as much unity as you'd like I wish uh, oh, I, I know all about the schism oriented politics, partisan yeah. politics in our movement, you know, and so uh I try so to much. avoid it as much as possible, but you know, uh uh people have different ideas and so if you look at any movement, the civil rights movement, uh or just about any movement, you'll see that uh uh the most uh uh virulent uh Disagreements often take place among people you would think would be nat- natural allies. Right. I was just surprised by the censor, the, the censure attempt uh, on the magazine. Basically, don't read it because basically we don't agree with what they're saying. Right. Uh, when it's a movement that should be all about freedoms, you know. It, just, it was ironic to me, that's all. Um, the other thing I ask is all these state initiatives, I mean, being from Canada, maybe I don't understand too well. Maybe I, maybe I do, but... Um, what like what protections do you have from the federal government, even if these initiatives pass? Like it, just, it depends to me that it's always because it's not the type of political system we have up here. Yeah, so it's just but, surprising to me that but you know that two two uh, the two levels can be at, clashing and have completely different laws governing the same the same issue. What mm-hmm. are you still going to be like dependent on a benevolent president kind of thing to to make sure that these these are not challenged or they're not they don't enforce them on a federal level? Like, uh, to some degree, um, I mean, uh, there is always the issue of federal interference. We've seen, you know, they haven't come in and interfered too heavily in the medical marijuana laws. Uh, but uh, we know that the corporate masters of our government are going to sick them on us when we try to legalize it entirely. But with four states at least voting on it, we could see a vote in Nevada and Alaska as well. Uh, maybe somewhere else that we don't know about yet. But the courts, yeah. are the courts the final arbitrator, or like, is there if it stands up in court, does that mean that it supersedes federal? I'm just uh, just from my yes. own curiosity, yeah. the way it in works. In fact, you know, there is a clause in the Federal Controlled Substances Act here in the United States, uh, Controlled Substances Act of 1971, is Title 21 of the United States Code, or 21 U.S.C. So, Section 903 of the Controlled Substances Act says explicitly that state regulation supersedes federal regulation of controlled substances. So uh, the actual citation is 21 U.S.C. 903. So if you go there, you know, there's all this talk, and almost everyone agrees that uh, federal law supersedes 
uh, state law, but when it comes to Controlled Substances Act, to the Controlled Substances, the actual act at 21 U.S.C. 903 says that uh, state law supersedes federal control of controlled substances. So in the end, yes, it is the courts. And boy, I'll tell you, I'm sorely disappointed with the Supreme Court of the United States we have right now. And they just declared that corporations have more rights than natural human beings. And I think that's a egregious and uh, di- potentially dis- dystopian type of uh, mistake there. You know, with the growth of artificial intelligence over the next 30 years, we better protect the rights of natural individuals now. But we are not going to do it with the U.S. Supreme Court we have in power today. I agree. The one thing people don't understand, too, Paul, the singles narc- – you're talking about the international treaties and stuff and the – Singles Narcotics Treaty, which was devised in the 60s by Anslinger. He was one of the you know proponents of that, same guy that did the tax. Yeah, that was tax thing. Yeah. No doubt. They, they're in the Singles Narcotics Treaty, which actually brought about our Controlled Substance Act. Our, com- our connection to the International Treaty required us to come up with our own Controlled Substance Act. But it does have does have legislation in there that allows us to backtrack out of there, not only for cannabis, but hemp is excluded. It very clearly says in the Singles Narcotics Treaty that uh, none of the uh, controls or anything have anything to do with him. And really, this is sort of this has been kind of a wide open thing that we could latch on to before they change it because it's been that's been that way for fifty something years now, and uh, it's very plainly written in there. And it also says that if our president or our Congress or our Health and Human Services, which is actually the one that's going to make the decision here for, to, for just out, you know, to take it off controlled substance. They, uh, it says in there that they, they do, they are allowed to back out of our, uh, commit, you know, commitment to this treaty if we so desire to legalize cannabis in this country. But it absolutely clearly says hemp's not affected. I don't see why that we haven't jumped on that already. It just, uh, blows me away. Well, a number of states have attempted to legalize industrial hemp, uh, North Dakota and their Speaker of the House, the Republican uh, uh, Chuck Monson, he was uh, attempting to grow hemp, but the DEA won't allow it. The Drug Enforcement Administration, you know, they're locked into this low THC paradigm yeah. for hemp. And uh, it's, it's really just a false dichotomy because high THC cannabis produces more fuel, fiber, food, and medicine right. than, than low THC cannabis does. But... Uh, you know, the Single Convention Treaty of 1961 outlines a specific regulatory method that you have to implement if you're going to cultivate uh, uh, cannabis, and it's the same system of controls that they have for the cultivation of the coca plant or the opium. Right. And so we implemented that same system of controls. The Single Convention Treaty was originally implemented under the guidance of Harry Anslinger, and now the United Nations uh, yeah, yeah. guides it. It's been amended a couple of times, and there are uh, several subsequent treaties, these U.S. treaties on psychotropic substances. And so all of those uh, implement these controls, but they say that if a party, one of the nations that signs these treaties, if their constitution does not allow these restrictions, then uh, they don't have to follow them. Right. So I know that Bolivia and Peru have recently moved to withdraw from um, uh, the single convention treaty so they can produce coca and sure. use uh, natural coca for uh, chewing it in the traditional manner that the uh, indigenous uh, native population had been doing for centuries. We're coming up on a commercial break here. Uh, we'll be back in just a little bit. We have uh, Johnny V, the editor of Skunk Magazine, and Carrie Burns, the host of CannabisCorner.us. You're listening to Time for Hemp on the American Freedom Radio Network. Welcome back to Time for Hemp. I'm your guest host, Paul Stanford, sitting in for Casper Leach. We have our joint host on the line here, Carrie Burns. Welcome back, Carrie. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Johnny V from Skunk Magazine. Welcome back, Johnny. Hey, thanks, guys. So I see uh, you've got this shot versus shot on your website. Uh, You want to tell our listeners about that? 
Well, yeah, we encourage uh, readers or non-readers alike, just people that are that have uh, have something interesting in their gardens to take pictures and send it to us, and then we put it up to a vote on the website and in our magazine, and they get to win some pretty cool uh, prizes that are uh, that some of our advertisers have provided for them. So yeah, I got, you got to interview you got Mama something. Kind uh, last week and uh, talk to her about her upcoming book, which is a compilation of her articles there in skunk magazine so she's a regular contributor yeah she's been with us not from day one but pretty uh, pretty shortly after um i think she just fit right away uh when i when i met her she was uh she well as you know i guess she has, she answers she's our uh, like resident sex columnist sex advice guru so there's a lot she gets tons and tons of uh of questions pertaining to either sex and pot or or one or the other uh, separately. And this is a compilation of many of her, of the best questions and best answers, some of the quizzes she's done. And it's about to hit the shelves, I believe. Um, it's available on pre-order right now, but uh, I think they're in about a month's time it'll be out. And uh, she's actually our first contributor to, or our first skunk staffer to ever have a book, although the Rev is coming out with his uh, Grow book very shortly as well. And I myself are doing a couple of books with uh, Green Candy Press, one uh, featuring a lot of the MILFs that we've done, marijuana I'd love to find, not the other kind of MILFs, um, and another one, a collection of the, the interviews I've done with different breeders from around the world. So we're getting our, our stuff out there, some pretty crazy, unique uh, unique books out there. Especially That's the, great. I have one right here, and I can turn to any page and turn you guys both red. So, <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Let me see. What, what, let me, uh, it's pretty dark. So, Johnny, what are yeah. some of the things you're going to be covering in your upcoming issues? And if somebody wanted to get a copy, what would they do? Okay, there's a few ways to get a copy, but I'll, first I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing. It's our, uh, we're doing like a how-to kind of issue, whether it's, uh, the Rev is discussing his 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 way of, of making seeds, and uh, for a lot of his fans out there, um, we're doing how to make uh, hash using bolt bags, how to make a very very clean butter, uh, how to uh, how to basically adopt your. There's an interesting lighting article in there uh, that completely goes against the grain, but it's quite interesting. I don't want to give too much away, but there's. It's it's basically whether you're talking about garden or in your kitchen, anything have to do with cannabis. It's basically how to do stuff, you know. So that's our upcoming issue. It's going to be going to have a lot of good information for people that uh, grow either grow themselves or, or turn their grow into something else, you know. And how you get it? I mean, we're available at all the major bookstores. We took a little bit of a hit with Borders going down, but uh, Barnes and Nobles is picking up the. Uh, the uh, the extra copies as well as books a million. Um, we're in a lot of Seven Elevens in Colorado. Um, your local newsstand, smoke stand. You know we're 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 covering like we're we're a national magazine. We're not regional. We're all over the country. So shouldn't have too much hard time getting it. And if you do, you can always subscribe through our through the website or through the magazine. Great. There's no reason not to have a copy. No reason not to have a copy of Skunk Magazine. Well, I'm going to have to start getting some. I've I've had a couple copies over the years, but uh, I promise you, you got a new subscriber here. Well, send me send me your address. I'll make sure you get a copy every issue. Thank you, Johnny. I will. Nope. Um, right. So, uh, Carrie, tell our audience about your your radio show, Cannabis uh, Corner US. Okay, I, I wanted to tell Johnny first that I just voted too. I, 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 it was hard to decide, but uh, I, I, I did my voting. So it's pretty good gear up there, man. That's some, oh, some of these buddy, I'm t- <laughs> uh, just want everybody to tune in to cannabiscorner.us. dot us. We uh, we uh, put out videos each week. They're on cannabis and and this control arm that runs the government and. We want everybody to be sure and tune into YouTube Cannabis Corner or CannabisCorner.us and uh, check them out. Cool. And I have a, a weekly live television show that plays on cable here in Portland, Oregon, and we send it out via DVD to Seattle and Denver and Michigan and and, and a bunch of oh, about fifteen different cable systems. It's called wow. Cannabis Common Sense, and uh, it's an hour long show where. Uh, 
uh, going to do tonight uh, will be show number, I think it's 600, and, no, 596. We're closing in on show number 600 right now. Wow. So, That's great. Impressive. Started it back in October of 1996, so we're coming up on our uh, 15th anniversary as well. We've had all kinds of guests, including Mark Emery and Jack Hare and Keith Strop, and I can't even begin to name everybody else. But uh, and Casper, uh, yeah. Casper's been on a couple times, and so uh, uh, yeah, you can watch that live on UStream.tv. It's 8 p.m. Pacific time. That would uh, put it at 11 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and it's uh, live on Ustream, and you can watch the archive on uh, YouTube. And we have our old archive up on uh, uh, the uh, cannabis uh, site that Mark Emery used to have, Pot TV, for his Cannabis Culture magazine. So yeah. I was posting it back uh, way back when. That, that's just fantastic that you've got that long of a tenure going. Well, we keep it up, and little did I know when I started doing that show that it would turn into a medical clinic business. That never occurred to me. And so I had a doctor and a lawyer co-hosting the show with me, and uh, uh, when the medical marijuana law passed here in 1998 in Oregon and went into effect in 1999, I started getting calls saying, where can I find a doctor? Where can I find a doctor? Well, I had a doctor there on TV with me. So every week we would uh, see patients in the studio just before the TV show. And then we worked out of my house for a while. And then we opened our first office in Oregon in 2003. And we opened in uh, Washington State in 2004, in Hawaii in 2005. And when we opened in Colorado in 2006, there were only 700 patients statewide, and now they're up to about 180,000 medical marijuana patients registered in the state of Colorado, plus the whole new industry. And But now we have our DHCF medical clinics in 10 states, and it's all across the United States. So for more information, hey, that's on our web portal at hemp.org as well. We've actually helped 150,000 patients get legal and uh, become legal medical marijuana permit holders. Yeah. Well, that's pretty impressive, man. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of the mainstream legitimacy uh, came from the medical users. So, I mean, that's, uh, the more people get get access, the better. It makes it easier for everybody else as well. Yeah, it's hard for them to say it's a deadly drug or anything when... Uh, Grandma's using it to fight her cancer or chronic pain or any of the many things. And I see the the help it does for so many of our patients get off narcotics or I've seen MS patients all seized up where they could hardly move and they use cannabis for a week and suddenly you wouldn't even know they had MS anymore. It's amazing. It really is. It's a a real blessing to be able to assist people in doing that. So, uh, we continue to help people in 60 different cities across 10 states, and we're about to expand into New England here in the next six months, too. People need to look at statistics. Nobody's ever died from using cannabis either. You can't say that about any other substance out there. That's true. Aspirin is a lot more poisonous. and a lot more Aspirin poisonous kills more than all illicit drugs combined. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and not to mention the ibuprofen and, and specifically Tylenol as well. So many oh. people have lost their their uh, kidneys because of that. Yeah, it's terrible. And, you know, kidney dialysis is one of those things that's crippling the uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, program that they've got going. Over. Why they always run out of money is because they have these private uh, diabet- I mean, uh, people with diabetes and stuff, they have to have their kidneys pumped. And, I mean, they milk the system big time. But it's yeah. all good and legal, right? <laughs> good and legal. There you go. Yes, sir. Well, the whole uh, pharmaceutical benefit they put into the Medicare program was a poison pill meant to cripple it because the federal government doesn't get any rights to uh, to negotiate bulk purchases of these pharmaceuticals. They have to pay full retail. And the, right. the cons or Republicans that put that into uh, – the bill knew they were uh, 
poisoning Medicare, and they wanted to get rid of it. So, uh, again, it's just another uh, marriage of the, the fascist corporation state that uh, we see so predominant here in the United States today. Well, it's a way for them to make sure that the money gets rerouted to where they want it to. That's uh, not where it's most needed. So, it's... Well, we're down to about a minute to go. Johnny, you want to put in a plug for Skunk Magazine? Well, like I said, on the issues right now, on these shelves right now is our 50th issue. Uh, it's a must-have. And inside you'll find a little surprise called Sparky Bucks, and you can use them uh, from denominations from 10 to $50 on many of our advertisers on the Skunk Island store. Uh, you don't want to miss this one. Great. And uh, Carrie? CannabisCorner.us. Give my love to Casper when you see him and tell him I wish him the best. I'm going to be taking a bouquet of beautiful Oregon organic flowers to him here in just a couple hours. You'll be happy to hear that. And I'll be back uh, next Monday. Uh, you're listening to the American Freedom Radio Network. I'm the guest host, Paul Stanford at hemp.org. And uh, this is Time for Hemp.